Well, it's time to begin with our next overview, and this is number 26 in our 27 uh, Pioneer timeline chart. The second of the ones that was born after the passing of the time, second generation group here, and this is E.J. Wagner. Wagner's picture, the young Wagner's picture is here uh, on our overview, and he's a young man who looks quite intelligent with those glasses. Um, we have several issues that highlight him. This volume, 8, number 2, Joseph Wagner prior to 1888, is the um, first issue dealing with his biography. And this is the next one, The Rise and Decline of Ellet Joseph Wagner, volume 8, number 3. And then we actually have another issue, volume 8, number 4, in which, like we did with Jones, we republish Wagner's writings on the faith of Jesus, extract of his writings. And again, these are all available on the website for, for free downloading. Well, let's go through his, uh, his outline that we have here, this two-page outline on him. <clears throat> E.J. Wagner was born January 12, 1855, so he was basically five years younger than Jones, if you recall. He was born in 1850. Um, not too much about his early life um, that we'll cover. 1874 to 78, from the ages of 19 to 23, he studied at Battle Creek College, University of Michigan Medical School at Ann Arbor, and Long Island College Hospital of Brooklyn, New York. And if you look at the footnote I give you on here, there's, there's been confusion about as to the years of his training and actually where he took medicine. But apparently, the biography that's just been published recently about him gives evidence that the family tracked down that his medical training was not at Bellevue, as is often reported, another place in New York City, but it was actually at this Long Island College Hospital of Brooklyn. So he's actually trained as an MD. And he came back um, and worked uh, at Battle Creek for some time. Uh, 1879, that should be, March 30th, at the age of 24, he marries a Jesse F. Moser in Sigourney, Iowa. And they, were, they would have later on two daughters, Bessie and Pearl. Um, after a couple years in Battle Creek area, he moves to California in 1880 at the age of 25, and he works at the St. Helena Rural Health Retreat. His great-grandson is a physician and is there currently. In fact, when uh, his name is Jim Peters, when he first went to work there, they actually uh, made something of that because here were two physicians, you know, generations apart. <laughs> it may have been at one of the one of the celebrations, uh, anniversary celebrations of Saint Helena, that they did that. 1882, at the age of 27, he had the turning point in my life, as he described it, at a Healdsburg camp meeting, which again, Saint Helena is in the Napa Valley. Healdsburg's across the ridge to the west and that next valley over. Uh, Russian River Valley, I think it is there. And this is how he described it some years later. Suddenly a light shone about me and the tent seemed illumined as though the sun were shining. I saw Christ crucified for me and to me was revealed for the first time in my life the fact that God loved me and that Christ gave himself for me personally. It was all for me. If I could describe my feelings, they would not be understood by those who have not had a similar experience. And to such, no explanation is necessary. To such who, had, who have had it, <laughs> no explanation is necessary. So this was the turning point in his life. And if we were to read the whole statement, he said he determined from that day to find Christ in all of Scripture and to find nothing but Christ. <laughs> and that was from his uh, preface to his uh, book, Everlasting Covenant. He wrote in 1900, published in 1900, page 5, paragraph 1. It's on the CD-ROM as well. 1883, here's where his life begins to merge a bit with Jones. He becomes assistant editor of the Signs of the Times. Again, assistant to whom? No, he's assistant with. He's assistant to J.H., his father. Remember? Um, 
1884, he meets Jones at age 29. In 1886, age of 31, he writes 33 articles in the Signs of the Times on righteousness by faith. That same year, the General Conference officers vote against publishing contrary views. <laughs> Butler distributes at the General Conference of 1886 his rebuttal of Wagner entitled The Law in the Book of Galatians. <clears throat> Ellen White is taken in vision from Switzerland, which is, which is where she was in 86. She was in, she was in Europe for two years, August of 85 to August of 87. And so in the middle of that time, 86 conference takes place. She's taken in vision to this. She actually recounts this two years later at the time of Minneapolis. And here's what happened. Her guide, she said, stretched out his arms toward Dr. Wagner and to you, Elder Butler, so this is a letter to the butler she's writing, and said in substance as follows, neither have all the light upon the law, neither position is perfect. 1886. That was the 1880 materials, page 93, paragraph 2. And then at another point, she's re recounting the same vision, and, and these are the words, said my guide, there is much light, yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. Notice, what are the two things? Law of God, gospel of righteousness. This seems to be her way of describing the 1888 message. In fact, later on she said, repeatedly, we have preached the commandments of God, re referencing Revelation 14, 12. <laughs> we preach the commandments of God, but we have not preached the faith of Jesus. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. See? And she says that Wagner was presenting the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. So this is the way in which this is being seen. And I, and I say, yet, this is our greatest challenge. To understand how the law and the gospel go hand in hand. Not just in our theory, but in our experience. <laughs> because we're in one ditch or the other as a rule. We're in one ditch or the other. And the, the, the well-known passage of Christ in John 8, talking to the woman caught in adultery, is a beautiful illustration of the law and the gospel going hand in hand. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And both of those statements, if you look at them, can be seen as, each of those statements can be seen as law and gospel. And it's just amazing how that they, they can be woven together that way. It's a beautiful way of thinking. Neither do I condemn you. Is that gospel or law? Gospel. We would usually think it's gospel. Go and sin no more. What do we usually think that is? Law. Okay. But think of it this way. Neither do I condemn you. Had she sinned? Exactly. The condemnation he's talking about is the condemnation of the law. Right? And the only way he could say, neither do I condemn you, was that who was going to be condemned? He was going to take her condemnation. He was going to be made sin for her. And that's why only, because he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And who was the only one there without sin? He was. So he's reserving, he was reserving the right for himself. But then he says, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get the stone put on me that, that you deserve. So is that law or gospel? It's, it's, it's affirming both, right? right? It's affirming both. And then he says, go and sin no more. Who, who would tell a sinner to sin no more? I mean, that's like telling a layman to rise and walk. Right? Why would you tell a layman to rise and walk? Unless you saw that he could do it. That, to me, is good news. That's not law. That's gospel. <laughs> His bidding is enabling, right? His word has the power. That's gospel. So you can say, isn't that amazing? At first we think one's law and one's gospel. We look at it a little bit more and we say, no, it's woven together in both of those statements. Law and the gospel is going hand in hand. But he's not... Pardon? Yeah, it's powerful when you dwell, dwell upon that. But think of it. He's just not preaching this. What is he doing? He's living it. There's a person there who needs it. And he's giving it to her. That's, that's the gospel going hand in hand. It's not just you know, giving it in your sermons and 
you know, in your Bible studies, whatever. It's how you treat people. That's that's really what 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 it needs to be seen here. Yes. Expressing his faith, the faith of Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. He sees she, he sees her as she can be, exactly. and he says, "Go do it." Right. And if she catches his vision, if she believes what he believes, then a miracle takes place. Just as the lame man, if, if the lame man catches the vision of rising and walking, and believes what Jesus believes, it happens. And then Jesus says, "Your faith has made you whole." <laughs> he gives us gives you the credit for it. He doesn't even take the credit. That's how humble he is. And so this is the message that I, that I see the angel telling Ellen White in 1886. There's more light to come from this, you know? Can you see the impact that would have if the world was filled with people that did that? They would be work, doing the work of Jesus. 1887. He's 32 years of old. He writes out, a, 32 years of age, and he writes out a reply to Butler entitled the, the Gospel in the Book of Galatians. What was Butler's? Uh, the, law. the Law in the Book of Galatians. <laughs> and here's the Gospel in the Book of Galatians. Um, February 10, Ellen White writes to him. Again, remember we, we, we noticed this with Jones? They got a letter in February of 87. Do not publish your differences. <clears throat> Notice that. Eight days after he finishes writing his thing. So he does not publish it until December of the next year. By that time, what did Ellen White said? She had written Butler, you have circulated your pamphlet, now it is only fair that Dr. Wagner should have just as fair a chance as you have had. She, basically, she said, if the cat's out of the bag, and you've already published your differences, then don't think you're, you're the only one that's going to have the right to do that. There's a thing called justice, right? In fairness. And that was 1880 materials, page 35. She wrote that to Butler. The next year, 1888, at the age of 33, Wagner publishes Fathers of the Catholic Church, a brief examination of the falling away of the church in the first three centuries. So he also was writing on history, an account of um, the great apostasy mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And of course, that same year, 1888, was the Minneapolis Conference, Minnesota. And he presented presentations on righteousness by faith there. And here's Ellen White's descriptions of those meetings and Wagner's view. <clears throat> Some of this we've touched on briefly, but let's continue to, to let her speak. Dr. Wagner has spoken to us in a straightforward manner. There is precious light in what he has said. Eight materials, page 163, paragraph 2. Dr. Wagner has opened to you precious light. Not new, but old light, which has been lost sight of by many minds and is now shining forth in clear rays. So, what is it? Is it new? Yes, but not fully new. <laughs> yes. It's like Christ said to the people in his day, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. It was a new commandment? No. But it was a renewed commandment. <laughs> And it was in new settings, right? He was living it in a way that no one had ever lived it before. So, that's what she's seeing. Old light in new settings. That was page 174 of 18 materials. Continuing, another statement. Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. Notice that. She's weaving these together in how she's describing it. This was no new light. It was old light placed where it should be. Where? In the third angel's message. Again, remember Revelation 14, 12. The people who stand during the final conflict when Babylon falls, those that endure, they keep two things. What do they keep? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And she, and she says, the law and the gospel going hand in hand. This is, this, is the me, this is the third angel's message. You can see why she said they were presenting it. And this is what's going to enable people to stand. And so how the Adventist church had been preaching the third angel's message since the 1840s. But this part had been missing. She said it had been missing. In fact, here's how she describes it. And that was page 211, by the way, 1880 materials. 
Statement, the faith of Jesus has been overlooked and treated in an indifferent, careless manner. It has not occupied the prominent position in which it was revealed to John. Faith in Christ as the sinner's only hope has been largely left out, not only of the discourses given, but of the religious experience of very many who claim to believe the third angel's message. At this meeting, I bore testimony that the most precious light had been shining forth from the scriptures in the presentation of the great subject of the righteousness of Christ connected with the law. There it is again which should be constantly kept before the sinner as his only hope of salvation. Page 212, 18 materials. Continuing, I have had the question asked, what do you think of this light that these men, speaking of who? Jones and Wagner are presenting. Her answer was, why, I have been presenting it to you for the past last 45 years. The last 45 years. What was it? The matchless charms of Christ. So was it new light? It was renewed light. <laughs> she says she'd been presenting the last 45 years. The matchless charms of Christ. See, this is not just doctrine. This is, this is a being who, who's, who is charming. He's attractive. And he draws people. If I be lifted up, I will draw all to me. That's what Wagner was doing. Not just preaching theory and doctrine. She continues. And then she says, she says, I have been presenting it to you the last 45 years. Then she says, this is what I have been trying to present before your minds. What does that imply? Don't know if I succeeded, right? Don't know how well I've done. Because she says, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, excepting the conversations between myself and my husband. No sermons, no articles, private conversations that she'd had with James, probably, obviously before he died, um, and probably just before he died. Remember when we, when we went through his life? Some of those things right at the end of his life? He says we need to be writing on this glorious subject of redemption that God's been opening to our minds. And he was dead within a few weeks. So here she's thinking, this is what we were talking about. We were just beginning to see it before James died. That's, that's what I'm reading here. And then she says, when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. So you can see why she thought this was an incomprehensible tug of war. Who would oppose this? Who would, who would belittle the guys that were sharing this message, the, the men that were sharing this message? That was at page 348, paragraph 4 of 18.8 materials. So you see her view of what was being said. 1889, Wagner's 34 years of age now. He was a general conference delegate at large at the 89 conference. And he taught Bible, church history, and Hebrew at, ministerial, at the ministerial institutes that were being established that we mentioned earlier under Jones that Prescott was instrumental in getting going. He also published Why We Oppose Religious Legislation, 24 pages, on uh, the importance of separation of church and state. 1890, at the age of 35, he published Christ and His Righteousness. It is thought that this is the closest to the topics that he presented at Minneapolis. This collection of studies titled Christ and His Righteousness. 96 pages. Ellen White wrote that year to the Bible School, which is the ministerial institute that was being conducted. And she actually, I'm sorry, she said this. She was there in person. And she, um, this is recorded from what she said at, the, at, the, at that school. I believe without a doubt that God has given precious light at the right time to Brother, J Brother, Brother Jones and Brother Wagner. Do I place them as infallible? Do I say that they will not make a statement or have an idea that cannot be questioned or that can, cannot be error? Do I say so? No. I do not say any such thing. But I do say God has sent light and do be careful 
how you treat it. Pretty clear, huh? Page 565, 18 materials, paragraph 2. And then she said, the same series of meetings, there was a controversy. Actually, at the conference, at the, at the Institute, Wagner was presenting one view of the covenants and Uriah Smith was presenting another view. And she had a dream that Wagner's view was correct. And she got up and said it. And she says this, Since I made the statement last Sabbath, the view of the covenants, as it has been taught by Brother Wagner, was truth, it seems that great relief, great relief has come to many minds. You can imagine. Here's the respected editor of the review presenting one view and Wagner presenting another view. And Ellen White's saying that Wagner has been presenting beautiful light, and, but Brother Smith has been the leader for many years. Who's right? And she finally stood up and said, Brother White is right. And she said, relief to many minds. Now we know what side it's on. What side it needs to come down. But remember, we looked at Smith's life in the last year of his life, as editor of the Review, he published articles that presented the old view of the covenants. Not ones that he wrote, somebody else wrote. And that was why they removed him as being editor just before he died. Which Ellen White said it was a mistake. Again, that's divine wisdom to know that you leave a man in who still is confused over these issues. It was important for other reasons, and we touched on those in his life. 1891, at the age of 36, Wagner at, uh, was at the General Conference session, and he presented 16 Bible studies on the Book of Romans. The, some of these, uh, I'm sure, were later put into the articles in, in Present Truth that he wrote. They've been collected into a book called Wagner on Romans. It's a modern compilation of those uh, articles that he published in the Present Truth. Um, but he's already writing, he's already giving studies on Romans here at the General Conference in 1891. That year, he was appointed editor, as we mentioned earlier under Jones. He's appointed editor of the present truth periodical in England. So, 1891 was the big year. Three years after Minneapolis, Ellen White is sent where? Way to the west, across the Pacific Ocean to Australia. Wagner sent where? Way to the east, across the Atlantic Ocean to England. And there's evidence that there were people that wanted neither of those people in Battle Creek. And that was at least partly behind what was happening of getting these men. And Jones is left there, uh, in a sense by himself, not by himself totally. But again, Jones is there to face the bitter opposition at home without uh, the support in person of his close associate Wagner and, of course, uh, the messenger of the Lord. 1892, Ellen White, um, again, confirms the message of righteousness by faith is from God. And many of these statements we read under Jones, and I'm just repeating some of them here, um, from 92 to 95, statements of endorsement. The message is from God, and she spoke again, speaking about these two men. If people reject the message because these men were to be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy, they would enter into a fatal delusion. Materials, page 1044. She said that the message that Wagner was presenting along with Jones was the message of God to the Laodicean church. And she's, she's writing this in a letter to Smith. And she says, Woe be to anybody who does not take up this message and present it. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's not... I think it's more than just a veiled woe on Brother Smith. She actually says at the end of the letter, I hope that you triumph with the third angel's message. This is after his confession that he had been opposing her. She's still writing to him letters like that, that, the, that he was still not grasping. Uh, it, it was still a snare to him, the position he took in the very beginning. That was, again, 1052 from the 1880 materials. And finally, another series of statements, a most precious message, the message that God commanded to be given to the world. This is in a letter to the GC president, O.A. Olson, 1895, pages thir page 1336 of the 1880 material. And then also another reference on 1818 and the 1888 materials. That's a very powerful endorsement. 1893, Wagner at the age of 38 publishes The Gospel in Creation. I was just listening recently to the uh, personal testimony of, of Pastor uh, Bill Lehman that he gave when he was pastor here at the Hill Church. And for years he struggled to understand righteousness by faith. Thought he understood it, but he knew something was missing. 
And he came across this book he'd never seen before. And this in the book that was published a few years later, Glad Tidings, Gospel and Creation, and there were ideas that he'd never seen before. All the years he'd been studying righteousness by faith. Never seen it before. And Wagner's presentation of, of a sinner's need of God, that in himself a sinner is nothing and God is everything. He had never thought of that before. He said, I always thought that God told me to do something, I could do it. I didn't realize how dependent I was on God. That without Him I'm nothing. And Wagner was presenting this powerfully. And this is what I think began to break through in, in, in Pastor Lehman's experience. It's a powerful sermon if you want to listen to it. It's called From Legalism to Grace. <laughs> and it's on my website um, under Pastor Lehman's sermons. Laying our, glory laying, laying our glory in the dust. For us. Well, yeah. He's just, um, again, another personal testimony, but he's, he, Pastor Laban is just telling his own experience, how he struggled for years. Read books, heard people uh, you know, talk about it, and he just gives his own experience of his walk and how he finally began to realize that uh, he didn't love people. He did not love people, and that's what was missing. And uh, he looked back in his life, he'd already been pastoring for years. And there were some bright spots in his, in, his, in his past experience. He realized, you know, there I, I was in a board meeting once, and they wanted to disfellowship a lady, and, and she needed to be disfellowshipped. But I, I, I labored with the, the church board for a half hour, don't give up on this lady. You know, she needs to be, she needs to be disfellowshipped, but don't give up on her. You know, be redemptive in what we do to her. And he says, I looked back at that, and that was amazing. He said, that wasn't me. I didn't feel that way about people. You know, he, he began to realize that the Holy Spirit had been working in his heart. And he began to see that even though he didn't love people naturally, there were times in which he acted like it. So the Holy Spirit must have been working with him. Anyway, um, Wagner was powerfully effective in that man's ministry. Love of Christ constraints. Yes, love of Christ constraints. 176 page book of the Gospel and Creation. 1897, at the age of 42, he presents 19 Bible studies at the GC session. So he's coming back from England to the general conference sessions that are in the States. 1898, again, general conference session, he presents Bible studies. And 1899, age of 44, he's also at the general conference session. And, but there he's beginning to re reveal that he's, his ideas of, of how close God is to us. Again, the closest counterfeit to the genuine message of righteous by faith is pantheism. Because pantheism shows God very close, but in an erroneous way. And so it's, it's not too difficult to step across the line from the genuine God dwelling in us by faith. And God being close to every, everything He's made, intimately close, sustaining everything, right? The omnipresence of God. You know, how does that become pantheism? And, and Wagner began to struggle over how, you know, how to describe this. Yeah. Yes, spiritualism is a ditch. Ellen White labeled it as spiritualism, but it's a it's a brand of spiritualism that has that has amalgamated with materialism. Philosophically, coming from, from philosophical labels, it's it's a spiritualism, but only an amalgamation with with, with, with materialism. But see, God put spirit and matter together in a realistic way, and that's the genuine. These are all counterfeits. You, you divide that into the dualism of spiritualism and materialism, or you combine them erroneously in, in pantheism. But which is the greatest danger church of Omega? I believe the Omega of, that she talked about is spiritualism. Not, not that the dead are not dead. I'm talking about philosophical, theological spiritualism. Which basically says um, you can have faith and and there's nothing to show for it. That's that's ghost ghostly ideas, you know. Faith, faith without works is what dead. As James says, as the body without the spirit. See, you see the idea of spiritualism being there. If you believe you can have faith and there's nothing to show for it, you are a, a theological spiritualist. That leads you to believe that most everyone, that everyone that professes Christianity is going to be saved. Right, right. They just believe. They just believe, yeah. And that, that, is, that is the erroneous faith-only position. 
there, there is a genuine faith only, and that means faith is the only way that we're saved. But faith is never alone. Faith always works. And if it doesn't, it's, it's dead. Which, which believe if, if you believe something dead is alive, you're a spiritualist. You know? Again, there's, there's where the ideas come, come out from that. And so there, there's, the, there's the thing that we need to... And that's basically the inroads of spiritualism into the Adventist church has occurred mostly since uh, uh, the days of Jones and Wagner. Not because of them. I mean, it's been in Christianity in large. But the, the, the Christian views of, of theology have come into the Adventist church in a big way. And I believe that's the Omega that Ellen White was, was talking about. Back in her day, um, the Alpha was pantheism, which was this erroneous mingling of the two. Before Minneapolis, we were in the ditch of materialism. You know, all the Lord said we will do. <laughs> Old covenant, law, law, law. That's, that's, that's sort of theological materialism. But um, the Lord called us out of that ditch. We refused the light, so we headed for pantheism, the abyss, as it were. And God saved us from that. The only thing left now is the, the counterfeit of spiritualism, which is where I think it's rampant in, in our philosophical, theological views now. Right. Yes? Faith causes us to walk after the oh, yeah. Spirit. Oh, yeah. Faith is a gift of the Spirit. You don't even have <laughs> faith without the Spirit. We're yeah, and we're, we're walking, walking in the Spirit, as Paul says, very much so. Um, so, again, don't fault the man. Who of us have said it exactly right as we've struggled to push the, the envelope, as it were, of describing what God really wants for us? Um, it's, it's nuanced more than most of us even fathom, you know? Ellen White even said, when she talked about the law and the gospel going hand in hand, she said, I cannot find words to express this in its fullness. Um, she was struggling. Um, so, 1900, age of 45, he publishes this book, probably you could say it's his magnum opus, The Everlasting Covenant, 531 pages. An amazing book. Um, not perfect by any means, but the GC president thought that should be distributed to every, everybody. It's a tremendous missionary book. A.G. Daniels. Um, that same year published The Glad Tidings, 565, 265 pages. What's The Glad Tidings on? Galatians, letter to Galatians, <laughs> goes clear back to, you know, pre-Minneapolis days, the, what, what, what the book of Galatians was all about. Tremendous gospel-oriented book, but has a lot to say about the law, and they were arguing over which law it was. We didn't mention it in Wagner's story here, but remember, Ellen White, in 1895, 1896, I beg your pardon, finally took a, a position on what law it was in the book of Galatians. And she says it was especially the moral law, which is what Wagner was presenting here. And so, again, the book of Galatians is a powerful book in putting the law and the gospel hand in hand. And if we don't understand that properly, if we only think the law in the book of Galatians is a ceremonial law, then we don't understand the full message of how it's the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus going hand in hand. You see the significance? If this is the ceremonial law, how can that go with the faith of Jesus. They do go together. The ceremonial law reveals to us in symbols Christ's extent of giving his life for us in faith, right? Faith of Jesus. But what is it that requires the death? It's the moral law. It's the moral law that says what sin is, what the wages of sin is death. And that requires that uh, gospel solution for sin. Unfortunately, 1903, at the age of 48, Kellogg, when he publishes The Living Temple, he credits Jones and Wagner for helping, with helping him. In fact, right outside the box, I put it there. The preface to The Living Temple, the author desires to acknowledge his indebtedness for many valuable suggestions and emendations to A.T. Jones and E.G. Wagner. He acknowledges indebtedness to these men. Unfortunate. E.J. Wagner actually speaks of the Living Temple in a letter to Prescott, and I have that in the next bracketed thing there, January 14 of 1903. I cannot detect anything radically wrong in it. Did Ellen White see anything radically wrong in the Living Temple? Satanic sophistries. So what's happening to Wagner at this point? 
this perception is becoming clouded. And Ellen White writes to him of his peril. And we think it's theological? Not only. October 5, same year, 1903, he's 48 years old, Ellen White writes to him, Satan is working stealthily, untiringly, to effect your downfall through his specious temptations. He is determined to become your teacher. And you need now to place yourself where you can get strength to resist him. He hopes to lead you into the maze of spiritualism. He hopes to wean your affections from your wife and to fix them upon another woman. He desires that you shall allow your mind to dwell upon this woman until through unholy affection she becomes your God. Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, page 199, paragraph 3. He's not identified there, but that's a letter to him. A few days later, in fact, four days later, she writes to him again in Sutherland these words. Faith of Jesus? I have had much confidence in Brother Wagner, but I know that just now he is in special danger. He is in danger, as many others are, of accepting incorrect views of God as set forth in the book, in the new book, Living Temple. What does she say to do? Take him into the school at Berrien Springs. What does she mean? As a student? No, as a teacher. Faith of Jesus, right? Let's, let's, let's put this man where he can have good influences around him and we can save him, right? Faith of Jesus. My counsel regarding his work is that you help him to place his feet on solid ground, even the rock of ages. I believe that he will recover his former clearness and power. Spalding McGann Collection, page 328, paragraph 2. Amazing story, huh? He never ended up at Bering Springs. Where did he end up? Battle Creek with Kellogg. 1904, August the 1st. He's 49 years of old age and she sees a vision. And by the way, this is not only Wagner, but this was also in this vision, Jones was there too. And she said, I don't have the full thing here, but the counselor that she sees in his vision puts his hands on both of these men's shoulders. So he's standing between them. He puts his hands on both of these men. And he says to them, you are confused. You are in the mist and fog. You have need of the heavenly anointing. Volume 21 of Manuscript Releases, page 176.3. The next year, 1905, April the 9th, he's 50 years old. Ellen White writes about him. Unless he is converted, he is not fitted to act any part in the ministry of the work. He is a decided transgressor of the seventh commandment. Apparently did not break off his affinity for this woman who was not his wife. Echoes of J.H. Wagner, his father, Remember we, when we read about his story? Major problems with his wife. Wife was, a, wife was someone Ellen White said he had a right to leave at one point. He had, he had grounds, biblical grounds to leave her. And he, and he should have. But then he took her back and then became so, I guess, turned against her that he wrote her cruel letters and put his affections on another woman. And anyway, E.J. grew up in this situation and not obviously unaffected, um, cultivated in, in hereditary tendencies. He didn't have a, a, a perfect male role model, as we would say. And uh, I don't have the details here, but the next year, the, the same year, 1905, his wife files a divorce for him. Okay? And he's then disfellowshipped from the church. Back in those years, divorce usually ended up in disfellowshipping. Um, there's disagreement as to all the details of this divorce. Some people say his wife was actually the one who was, got, had an affair with somebody else. Um, but clearly Ellen White saw him removing his affections from her and being attracted somewhere else before the divorce took place. Um, there's probably not perfection on either side, as, as usually there is not. <laughs> but um, that's the situation that we find. 
1905, and then there's not a whole lot that we want to cover in the next 15 years. He's in Battle Creek. He's still active, doing some work as a doctor. And um, 1916, the year after Ellen White dies, at the age of 61, he dies of a heart attack. And so that's the, the story of E.J. Wagner. His material is still valuable. We have, again, along with Jones, pretty much their entire collection on the CD-ROM. And we can learn from their lives and bl be blessed by the light that God gave through them, at the same time learning from their mistakes and hopefully not repeating them and letting God move on with the message to its completion.